This audio presentation of Hi Dad is brought to you by the Supreme Council of the Scottish Rite, Southern Jurisdiction. Written by Herbert Ewing Duncan. Executive Producers. Scottish Rite Grand Commander James D. Cole, 33rd Degree. Grandmaster of Demolay John Sellers and Demolay Grand Secretary Stephen E. Crane. Narrated and produced by Matt Bowers, 32nd Degree. Consulting Producer Dean Alban, 33rd Degree. Hi Dad Book, copyright 1981, audio recordings copyright 2023, all rights reserved. For information on how you can donate to support this audio serial, visit demolay.org. Chapter 9. Don't Mind the Gray Skies The psalmist had said, Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain who built it. Frank Land knew that no vain labor had entered into the acquisition of a permanent headquarters for Demolay. It represented years of working for what he believed was the moving direction of God within him to provide a home for Demolay and the youth of the nation. He was proud of the building. Many evenings during the work of remodeling, he would walk the two short blocks from his apartment with his wife that she might see the progress being made and share his enthusiasm. On the evening walk, when the building was complete, the furniture and decorations in place, Nell was exuberant. She inspected each room from the basement to the second floor, giving words of womanly praise as she saw the imaginative work of her husband reflected in every area. Finally, as they entered the library, she climbed into one of the wing chairs, tucked her legs under her, and in the comfort of this friendly room simply said, Frankie, it is lovely. You have done so much for these boys of yours. Frank sat down in the upholstered chair behind the desk so that she could see how he would look in his new office, smiled, and said, I am so glad that you approve. Just imagine how far we have come. Remember the first report of our treasurer? It is hard to believe, but at that time the Order of Demolay had exactly two dollars and twenty-five cents. Why that amount, and how could you possibly remember it? Oh, it is easy to remember. The money came from the first nine boys paying their dues 25 cents each. How could I forget? Judge Cochran did not live to see the completed building for on May 1st, 1928. He quietly passed away in St. Luke's Hospital, St. Louis, Missouri. He too would have taken pride in this landmark of the order for he had given so much to the formation of Demolay from his great personality and his wide experience in fraternal organizations. Frank Land looked to him as a constant source of strength and the one in whom he could find guidance. When the news of Cochrane's death reached him, he told the members of his staff that Cochrane had been a sick man when he presided over the Grand Council sessions in March of that year. He said, The gavel almost fell from his fingers as he closed the meeting. Then, reflecting on the past, he continued, The Order of de Malay lost not only one of its best friends, but a tower of strength, when this kindly old gentleman passed away. Had it not been for the interest he took when only a few boys constituted our membership, there would have been no Order of de Malay. He was ever ready to champion our cause, and whether it was tempest or distance, no sacrifice was too great for him to make on behalf of youth. He had served as Grand Master from the first meeting of the Grand Council of the Order of Demolay until the moment of his death. During the Grand Council session of 1929 held in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Sam P. Cochran, prominent Scottish Rite Mason of Texas, was selected to make a tribute to Alexander G. Cochran. In this eulogy, he said, he was a man of great heart, warm in his friendship, and when he became the head of this order, he drew to himself the affection and sincere regard of the multitude of men and boys who have become interested in the order of Demolay. In his fraternal life, he radiated a large influence for good, for the advancement of those high ideals which would make for better living among men and among boys. In his social relations, he enjoyed the distinction of occupying as high a rank as could be afforded one of his eminent ability and of his natural traits of kindliness and human affection. He gave to the Order of Demolay the best of the closing years 
of his life. We all remember how he presided over the last session of this grand council with grace, dignity, and kindness. When the shadows drew around his career and his life of usefulness, activity, and the great benevolence came to an end, it was the closing of a record of one who had lived in the light of a great devotion to what contributes to happiness here and leads to higher reward and honor hereafter. John H. Glazier had served as Deputy Grand Master during the long years of the administration of Cochran, and now, by vote of the Executive Committee, he assumed the office and duties of Grand Master Counselor. He was to serve in that position until March of 1931, for it was not until 1936 that the office of the Grand Master Counselor was restricted to a term of one year. These were the difficult days, the trying years. When he assumed the office, Demolay was part of the thinking of the late 1920s that only forward, constant progress was possible. Nothing, it was felt, could stop the inevitable prosperity and growth of the nation. The economy was at an all-time peak and the stock market became a source of high financial return to even the most modest investor. By the summer of 1929, there were signs of a let-up, but no one remotely imagined the total collapse that was to come with the failure of the stock exchanges on that fateful day in October when the boom of the 20s became only a memory. The days of the Great Depression of the 1930s descended upon a stricken nation to reach its lowest point in March of 1933. Unemployment reached the staggering total of 15 million as men willing to work for a dollar a week could not find work. Industrial output was cut in half. Mortgage foreclosures were widespread. A third of the nation's railroad mileage was in bankruptcy and proud men took their own lives in their desperation. No one was prepared for such a decline, and no one at first believed that it had all happened. Then, as the banks closed in the early days of the Roosevelt administration, it became all too clear that the nation, each individual, and every fraternal organization faced a crisis that offered only the promise of increasing difficulty, of restricted activities, and reduced income. All Demolay chapters felt the impact of the Depression. Many found it impossible to collect dues. There were few boys who could muster the money for even reduced initiation fees. Membership fell to new lows as, at one time, it was estimated that Demolay declined in a single year from a membership of 210,000 to 110,000. And yet, the chapters carried on. In some degree, the chapters found that the smaller number of boys gave increased activity for without summer employment and after school work. The members had more time to give to Demolay. They perfected their ritual work, and because no one had money for such things as entertainment, many a boy found with Demolay the only social opportunity he could afford. Here also found his companionship and his faith in the years that were to come. The aspirations of Dad Land were at the lowest point in his career. Demolay had grown with astonishing vitality for ten years, and now with the membership drastically diminished and few boys coming into the order, the money for the operation of Demolay had vanished. Sponsoring groups in the same situation were unable to help financially. Land turned to Charlie Boyce, time after time, to talk of some method to keep the order solvent. Charlie, he would say, I simply do not know what to do and yet I know some of the things we must do, and first among these is to be fair to our boys. You know, I never forget a credo emphasized to me day after day, and sometimes many times a day by my mother. She would say, Never forget we live for the good opinions of our neighbors. This we must do regardless of all else. Then he added slowly as if he did not even want to hear the words. We are forced to reduce the expenses of operating the headquarters office. I do not want to do it, but we are forced to dismiss most of those who make up our office staff. Those that remain will not be able to draw a full paycheck. This decision was postponed time and again, but finally had to be made. Land and Boyce withdrew themselves from any salary and for a year or more, those who remained on the staff worked under a 50% reduction in salary. Finally, conditions became so stringent 
that Frank Land called all the employees into his office on March 6, 1933, and informed them that every one of them was to be laid off as of that evening with the exception of himself, Dr. Stanton D. Brooks, Charles A. Boyce, and Louis G. Lower. Eighteen men and women were forced to find other work, but as conditions improved, almost all of these were brought back to assume their places in the office. Walter Plozer, as a field representative traveling in the southern states, felt the full impact of the lack of money in Greenville, North Carolina. He had been staying at one of the better hotels, but as his funds began to run out and no prospect for more was in sight, moved to the cheapest hotel he could find. A flea-bitten joint, he said. Finally, with the last of the money he had, he sent a telegram to Kansas City for money to come home. The answer he received was short and sent only because Western Union had not yet canceled the credit of Demolay. It merely quoted a single line from the theme of a popular song. Wally, there will always be gray skies. Ted Little, in Indianapolis, Indiana, was more fortunate. At the desk of the Washington Hotel, he found a letter from John Agley of the headquarters staff that enclosed a check for $69 to cover his expenses and to tell him the field staff was dismissed. He rushed to the bank and cashed the check just one hour before the banks of the nation closed. There was nothing left for him to do except pack his belongings into the ancient Ford given to him as a field worker for Demolay and start for home. As he drove, he thought of how Louis Lower had taught him to drive. He remembered the first lesson along the stretch of quiet road that led from Kansas City to Olathe, Kansas, and then as a final test, the crowded traffic of downtown Kansas City and the ascent up the steep Main Street Hill from south of the Union Station to St. Mary's Hospital six blocks away. It was a treacherous hill, the despair of many drivers. As he stopped at the top, white with tension, he turned to Louis and found him even more pale. Wiping the perspiration from his face, Louis had said, Boy, you made it, but how? One of the members of the Legion of Honor was asked to take a part in the investiture of his preceptory. He wanted to accept, but there was a financial problem similar to most of the young family men struggling to make a go of it during difficult days. He talked it over with his wife. I would like to go. These meetings always inspire me in the investiture itself, and it is the time to see my friends. But I can't afford it. There is the cost of a dinner. My suit needs pressing, and the last time it was pressed, the cleaner said it would be at our risk, not his. It was so threadbare, and there are holes in the soles of my shoes. His wife replied, Go on and go. I can fix up your suit, and you will be wearing a robe so when you kneel, just drape the robe over your shoes, and no one will see the holes. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if in these times that Frank Land has holes in his shoes but I bet those shoes will be polished as if he were going on parade. Holes in the shoes or no holes. She was correct in one thing. Frank Land never lost his composure, nor did he display the signs of defeat. The Legion dinner that year had the usual tall candles. The lush display of flowers and the dinner were the finest. There are many who look back upon these years with a feeling of pride. They drew everyone a bit closer together, as each shared the hardship of reduced finances. There was a challenge each day, and a sense of achievement as the times grew more prosperous and the gray skies began to break up to show the promise of better days. Dadland was the incentive, the source of inspiration to his boys as he weathered the storm with quiet confidence and deep religious faith. But confidence did not pay bills. In the low ebb of diminished income, it was impossible to make the bank payments due on the mortgage indebtedness on the headquarters building. Month after month, it was impossible to pay even the interest. Finally, when payments had lagged for more than a year, those who had purchased the mortgage papers called a meeting to decide if they should foreclose and take over the property. Mr. James P. McGilley, a prominent mortician of the city and dedicated Catholic layman, listened to the reasons for foreclosure, and then addressed the meeting, saying, I know the concern of each person present regarding the obligation represented in the shares of stock each of us holds in the mortgage of this valuable property. I also know of the good work that Demolay has done for the youth of the community and the nation. 
Frank Land has dedicated his life to this work. It has brought honor and national recognition to this city. If we should take the building from him, it would be a tremendous loss, perhaps a fatal loss, to an order for boys that had its start in Kansas City. The members of my family believe that Demolay should have added time to meet its financial obligations. I have their permission to cast our votes as being unfavorable to the proposed foreclosure. One of the other stockholders said, Jim, I believe you speak for each one of us. No one here really wants to foreclose. We share your regard for Frank Land. He will come through. As your family holds the controlling interest in this, let's all go home. Demolay survived the tragic decade only by the friends, the determination, the goodwill, and sincerity of Frank Land. The Depression years brought a great sense of soul-searching. How did it happen? was asked by many of the thoughtful people, and what lesson for the future can we learn? This challenge was reflected in the address of Grandmaster John H. Glazier at the opening of the 1931 session of the Grand Council, held in the Mayflower Hotel in Washington, D.C. Two years have elapsed since our last meeting, he said. Years of toil and effort, of triumph and defeat, of heartaches and the joy of accomplishment, of foundations laid for substantial progress and the failure of many plans. Many problems have been encountered, in the solution of which it has not always been easy to secure desired results. The world has been ill with business depression and forebodings. Hearts have been bowed down with many griefs. Stout resolution has been displaced in many instances with black despair. But through all the gloom, there has shone the morning star of youthful optimism, the star of Demole. Sometimes it seemed obscured in the fog of depression, but it has blazed forth anew, cheering on the hearts of its devotees, a beacon and a promise of better things. The surge of a new world of thought and inspiration and originality beckons to us. Are we capable of answering the call? Youth is going forward. It refuses to stagnate. It declines to be satisfied with antiquated devices and plans. The pulsating clamor for great adventure throbs in the blood and sings on the lips of the youth of the world. It is tremendous and awe-inspiring and epical. Demolay has the opportunity to strike out in the van of these thousands of young men and women, leading them, directing them, and satisfying their longings for growth and life. If we are content to follow the beaten track, if we rest upon past performances, if we are stereotyped and prosy, if we fail to grasp the glory of surging youth, Demolay is doomed to an inconsequential role in the scheme of things. May we rise to our opportunities. Let us swing into the gay and splendid pathway illuminated by the glory of constructive accomplishment. Demolay rose to the challenge. In fact, Two months before the address of John Glazier, public announcement was made of the appointment of Dr. Stanton D. Brooks as executive director of the Grand Scribe staff. This unassuming gentleman with his snow-white hair, friendly eyes, and scholarly manner was recognized nationally as one of the outstanding men of education. For eight years prior to his appointment in Demolay, Dr. Brooks served with such efficiency as president of the University of Missouri that he was selected as one of the 25 leading educators in the United States in a program sponsored by a New York newspaper. Dr. Brooks assumed his new duties in the early days of February. His executive ability and experience in administration had a far-reaching magnetism in lifting Demolay from the bog of the Depression. Chapters and men responded to him. They rallied under his flag of meeting their problems with realism. Reports once more flowed into the office, and Demolay became better prepared to meet the dismal years that came in the middle 30s. Frank Land realized that the Grand Council meeting of 1931, held in Washington, D.C., would be the last such assembly for several years and crowded as much into the sessions as possible. He did not imagine that it would be five years before another such meeting would be possible and that Demolay would be governed by an annual meeting of the Executive Committee until 1936. On March 16, 1931, 
the Committee on the State of the Order submitted a resolution stating, If the order of Demolay is to be extended to foreign countries, we believe there must be a form of government provided for them. Their resolution provided for the preparation of a statute for the formation and establishment of provincial grand councils in countries other than the United States. It listed the offices to be headed by a provincial grand master and that such officers should be subject to the constitution and statutes of the grand council and all acts must be in conformity therewith. It further resolved that when the said law was drafted by the jurisprudence committee, and approved by the Grand Master and Grand Scribe. It shall become effective in all intents and purposes as if enacted at this session of the Grand Council. The next day, March 17th, a preamble to the Constitution of the Grand Council of the Order of Demolay was adopted, which read in part, Freemasonry inculcates belief in God, patriotism, education, charity, benevolence, and the moral and social virtues and members of that fraternity for generations have sought to make practical application of such principles by extending relief to the orphan and the aged, to those sick in body or state, by aiding youth to fit themselves through education and training for the duties of life, and by other benevolences, and have sought to promote such ideals among youth with the consequent encouragement and development of good citizenship and sound character in part using the Order of Demolay as a means to that end. The Order of Demolay has never made but, on the contrary, expressly disavows any pretense or claims to be a Masonic organization, offering itself as one agency to aid in the accomplishment of such desirable aims. Originally, membership in the Order of Demolay was limited to the sons of Freemasons and their chums, it has now been found wiser to broaden the scope of the influence of the order by admitting to its membership young men between the ages of 16 and 20 inclusive, without references to their Masonic or other affiliations. Frank Land gave this word of appreciation. Your grand scribe cannot refrain from thanking each one of you in a most personal way for the many acts of kindness extended him in the past. This organization has prospered because Almighty God has smiled upon our work. Had it not been for your efforts and the brethren associated with you, we would not be meeting here today. May the coming year bring to each of you greater happiness and to the order of Demolay, a greater era of usefulness in behalf of youth. Each member of the Grand Council looked forward to the high period of the sessions, the opportunity of visiting the White House as the guest of President Herbert Hoover. Mr. Hoover, with his great humanitarian interests, had long been an enthusiastic friend of Demolay and of Frank Land. Now in Washington, he expressed his appreciation for the influence Demolay had given to the youth of the nation. He rose from his desk and greeted each man. Land, as he approached the president, presented him with the white cordon of the Honorary Legion of Honor, Frank Marshall, in defiance of the warnings of his doctors had insisted on attending the Grand Council meeting in the hope that he would be able to meet Herbert Hoover. But tragedy so often comes in a moment of triumph. As he approached the President to shake hands, he suddenly jerked his head back and turned abruptly away. He was quietly taken to a small room as the others continued to receive the welcome of Mr. Hoover. Every effort was made to calm his high state of tension, excitement, frustration, and disappointment. Mrs. Marshall suggested that they should take him to the home of Washington friends, Mr. and Mrs. R. R. Robb. He should never have taken this trip so far from home. His health was such that his physician urged him not to go. He seemed much older than his sixty-five years. His heart gave irregular response at times, and he suffered from extremely high blood pressure. On his arrival in Washington, he had suffered a minor cerebral hemorrhage, but his will to go on was supreme. I must attend the Grand Council meeting, he insisted. I must greet the President. His spirit, once so creative, now wandered in the shadows of the incoherent. At the home of his daughter, Mrs. Irwin L. Locker, in St. Louis, he was semi-conscious much of the time. Unable to sleep, 
he would pace the floor at night shouting long passages from his loved Shakespeare until the soothing voice of his daughter would bring him out of his ranting. Finally, he was taken to his home in Kansas City under the care of his wife. She poured out her love to him, but the span of life was almost over, and on March 24th, 1931, his spirit marched into the eternal. Snow was blowing in an early spring blizzard as the funeral procession made its way to Mount Moriah Cemetery for the burial of this man so beloved by the people of his city. Here the members of the mother chapter of Demolay formed honor lines as the mother chapter band played music in the spirit of those who had sailed beyond the sunset and the stars of all the western seas. He was referred to as one of the literary giants of his time, an eccentric genius who gave to the youth of the world a ritual as a guide through life. As the final words of the Masonic service were spoken, one of his friends was heard to remark, of course it was his heart that gave out, he had been giving his heart to others for all the years of his life. In fact, Frank Arthur Marshall was all heart. He believed and performed his idealism. Marshall's death was a sad experience for Frank Land, as it was a time of memory. They had worked so closely together during the twelve years of Demolay and had seen their dreams blossom into reality. Dad Land reflected, I feel lost without him, as so many feel lost. He was so much a part of my life, almost like a father to me. So often I have turned to him when I needed advice, and he always freely gave of his wisdom. I will never forget him, and Dimole will never forget him. A generation later, one of the past master counselors of Dimole, Rex Thrasher, wrote a history of Mother Chapter and included this opinion. Frank Land provided the occasion for the founding of Demolay. Louis Lower provided the members, but it was Frank A. Marshall, scholarly newspaperman, who provided the ritual, the vehicle which gave meaning to the order. The years following Marshall's death were quiet years, so quiet that the proceedings of the Grand Council were not published for the years from 1932 to 1937 and from 1943 to 1946. But change did come during this period as Dimele gradually gained strength from the disaster of the Depression. In April of 1934, the age requirement for membership was lowered from 16 to 15 years. Dad Land was aware that the older boys were going off to college, leaving the younger members to carry on with the chapter activities and that the 15-year-old youth could well take part in Dimele. Then, as he explained, the past years have made each of us grow up. A boy of 15 now is as smart, well-informed, fair-minded, and responsible as the boy of 16 was when we started. We should increase our membership by taking these younger lads into Dimele. Then, some of the titles of the Grand Council officers seemed cumbersome and wordy so that the title of the Grand Master Counselor was changed too. Grand Master, and the title of Grand Scribe was changed to General Secretary. Two honor awards were created in 1936 on the recommendation of the Jurisprudence and Legislative Committee to give recognition to those who had given extraordinary service to Demolay and to humanity. A member or deputy may confer upon any person over 21 years of age the Demolay Medal of Appreciation after filing with the Secretary General an intention to honor such person for outstanding service to the Order of Demolay or a subordinate chapter, and the Grand Council may, on nomination by a member or deputy, confer the Demolay Medal of Honor upon a member of the Order of Demolay who has performed an exceptionally outstanding service to humanity. Awards, recognition, and honors were a natural response on the part of Frank Land as an expression of his appreciation for courtesies extended to him and in recognition of the time given, the interest taken, and the leadership provided by those who had helped to build Demolay. As early as 1925, he had created the Demolay Cross of Honor for those men who guided the various chapters as advisors for three or more years with conspicuous service and outstanding efforts in behalf of Demolay. There was a degree of showmanship in the dramatic presentation of the awards created by Dad, 
but there was always the sincerity of a humble man who wanted so much to say thank you to those who, in his mind, deserved to be honored in this manner. His appreciation of the efforts given during the lean years was expressed by his words of confidence to the Grand Council in 1938. The movement has passed successfully through an era of worldwide industrial and financial chaos, he said. To be sure, the institution has not emerged from these trying times without some financial and material retardation, but in comparing our efforts and the success of our endeavor with similar movements, we cannot help but feel a profound degree of thankfulness for our present status. The old ballad of gray skies could be paraphrased with unrealistic optimism. Gray skies, all of them gone. Nothing but blue skies from now on.